here we are back at the Place du Bourg in Bruges. As I mentioned earlier, Philip the Good inherited Flanders and then took Holland away from his cousin Jacqueline, who'd inherited it herself from her uncle John, probably the first important patron of Jan van Eyck, about whom we'll hear more in just a minute. Since Philip also acquired Luxembourg, this means he ruled all of what we now think of as the Low Countries, modern Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. During Philip's reign, the Beguines and the Brethren of the Common Life flourished in the Low Countries, and the old Beguinage still survives in Bruges as essentially a home for female senior citizens. Here you can see it. The Beguines were women who lived in a semi-monastic state, but who did not take monastic vows and were free to leave any time. They supported themselves to a large extent by making lace, which is still a commonly practiced craft in Flanders, of course, though in Bruges it's become rare to see women doing it in public except in the lace making museum. The Beguines were always looked upon as a bit on the fringe of religious orthodoxy, as were the men and women who belonged to the Brethren of the Common Life, founded in Holland in the 14th century by Gerard Grota and Floris Radewein. This again was not a traditional monastic order, and members could come and go as they pleased, though obliged to live by the Augustan rule while in residence. Here you can see the Tower of Saint Sauveur in Bruges, which is now the cathedral and has been since about 1800 when the old cathedral of Saint Donatian was raised. The tower you see here was in fact mostly built in the 19th century, though most of the church is 14th century. The Brethren of the Common Life practiced what was called Devotio Moderna and became famous educators in Philip's day, using the classics liberally. They supported themselves through teaching and copying manuscripts. Many of the most important thinkers of the Northern Renaissance, in fact, were pupils of the Brethren, including Jean Gerson, about whom we've heard in passing, Rudolf Agricola, known as the father of mineralogy in Germany, Nicholas of Cusa, Thomas of Kempis, and the most famous of them all, Erasmus, about whom we'll hear later. Here is Notre Dame now, the most artistically important church in Bruges. Its 14th century spire at 400 feet is higher than any in France. We'll hear a lot about Erasmus later in the quarter, as I said, and more about Thomas of Kempis in a minute. But as for Nicholas of Cusa, he was, like Agricola, a real polymath, but he's best known for his book De Docta Ignorantia, or On Learned Ignorance, finished in about 1440, in which he argues, in effect, that the awareness of how little one knows is proportional to the amount one does know. That is, the more we know, the more we realize is yet to be known. He also argues that although it has been popular since Anselm first formulated the onlogical argument back in the 12th century to try to prove in some sort of rational sense that God exists, this cannot be done convincingly. However, God's existence can be known through intuitive awareness in something like, say, the same way you know you love your children or that you're awake. How would you go about proving you're awake now? <clears throat> Maybe that's not a good question to ask right now, but the point is you couldn't do anything as it were rational or scientific to prove it to yourself. You just know it. It's self-evident. This is to take a kind of mystical approach to religion, I suppose. Thomas Akempis, though he is often popularly regarded as a mystic, really took what should be regarded as a practical approach to salvation. <laughs> The spire of Notre Dame is very impressive, but one never sees the interior in art history texts, unless it's to show Michelangelo's Bruges Madonna, which is in the right aisle. The building itself is considered badly proportioned and somewhat cluttered. To return to Thomas Akempis, uh, according to Will Durant and others, uh, he lived the dullest life of any important author ever. He survived in 91 but spent 70 years of his life in an Augustinian monastery at Zwolle in Holland. What Thomas emphasizes is that the Gospels have to be taken literally and seriously, which can be a pretty scary thing to do. In the Gospels we read, Sell all that you have for the pearl of great price. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better to go to heaven 
blind in one eye than not to go at all. Call no man on earth your father. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Just saying you believe in God won't do. Actions speak louder than words. Here's a detail from a 15th century painting in which the Tower of Notre Dame shows up as well as the temporary spire on the Market Hall Belfry, uh, replaced by a, <clears throat> a permanent one which still survives in 1488. Pache, most of his biographers, I think Thomas Akempis' attitude is basically platonic and ascetic, and as I said, practical, in the sense that he wants to explain just what it is you have to do to be saved. He's uninterested in trying to rationally prove things and logically argue about them. For example, he says, I'd rather be conscientious than be able to define it. All this kind of stuff pales beside the central concern for salvation and life eternal. Think only of your salvation, he says, and only of the things of God. This is his constant theme. This life is but a test to see how we will spend all eternity, and only a fool would not do everything in his power to pass it even if that means living like a monk. I hope he's wrong. Well, here you can see Philip the Good in a manuscript illustration at Mass. In this picture, you can see him in his private chapel, I suppose, um, perhaps in the old church of St. Donatian. That's not a Brooks Brothers suit he has on, but he is wearing around his neck the symbol they use, which is also the symbol of the Order of the Golden Fleece. And you may have also noticed it in the portrait of him we saw earlier by Roger van der Weyden. This order was founded by Philip apparently originally to encourage a crusade. Why the Golden Fleece was chosen as the symbol of this order, which was to become the Habsburg equivalent to the Garter, and the most important order of chivalry in continental Europe, isn't certain. The first golden fleece to come to mind is, of course, the one in the story of Jason and the Argonauts, but the symbol itself was often referred to in the documents of the order as the Signa Gedeonis, the sign of Gideon, because in the Old Testament he had put down a fleece to receive the dew the Lord would send to convince him he was really hearing his voice, and this event was regarded as a prefiguration of the Annunciation. Philip was a great book collector, and 247 of his books are still together in the Brussels Royal Library today. This book of ours made for Philip is in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, and was illustrated by a fellow named Tavernier. But this page shows the adoration of the Magi. As I've said, in Northern Europe, manuscript illumination was looked upon as an important branch of painting, and almost all the important artists of the Renaissance practiced it, including the greatest painter of the 15th century in Northern Europe, Jan van Eyck. A modern statue of Jan van Eyck on the site of the former Cathedral of St. Donatian where he was buried. He was apparently born in Massaic near Liège in modern Belgium and was working in the 1420s for Count John of Holland. In 1425 he went to Flanders to enter the service of Philip the Good. Durant gives his date of birth as 1370 which is impossible. Uh, he was probably born about 1390 although there are some problems with that date too. This is the Rue Mandor in Bruges. We know that Van Eyck bought a house on this street, but it no longer exists. Most of the houses here are probably Victorian. We know of several things he painted for Philip, but none of them survived. Surprisingly, his most important work was all done for other patrons, despite the fact that he remained in Philip's employment, was paid a retainer the rest of his life, and was treated more as a friend than as a servant. He was sent on several diplomatic missions, and Philip was godfather to his children. The earliest things to be attributed to Van Eyck are some of the pages in the so-called Turin Hours book, from which you see the Requiem page here. Unfortunately, only two pages of this book survive. They were being restored when the rest of the book was destroyed in a fire in 1904. Black and white photos of some of the other pages also survive. The attribution of this work to Van Eyck is controversial, but the usual claim is that he was responsible for the overall project and 
at least may well have painted the two pages we're going to see. In any case, whoever painted these pages was clearly an exceptional illuminator. On this page, we see the birth of John the Baptist taking place, while his father, Zacharias, seems to be reading a newspaper or something in the room in the back. He didn't think his wife would bear a child at all because she had long been barren and was stricken in years. For this he was made mute by the Lord until the boy was in fact born. The atmosphere here is certainly a foreshadowing of the Flemish interest in genre painting. It almost looks like something to Hoke or even Vermeer might have done that they illuminated, illuminated manuscripts two centuries later. The treatment of the interior space in both of these paintings seems light years beyond Broderlam's altarpiece we saw last time, but Van Eyck was just of the next generation. I don't find that so odd, but it's one of the things cited to support the claim that they're not by him. Here's a close-up of the little scene at the bottom which depicts John baptizing Christ. H.W. Jansen says Van Eyck painted the first evolved landscapes in Western art. I don't know exactly what he means by that, but this is certainly an impressive miniature one. It's only a little bigger than a credit card. I should mention early on in the treatment of Van Eyck here that he apparently did have a brother, Hubert, who was also a painter. We'll hear a little bit more about this fellow when we see the Gen altar piece, but most modern scholars have pretty much given up on trying to attribute any surviving work to him except in the most conditional and tentative way. The Virgin in the Church in Berlin, which you see now, is often thought to be the earliest surviving oil painting by Van Eyck. It's only 15 inches high, so it's hardly bigger than a page in a book itself. Jan Huizinga, who wrote The Waning of the Middle Ages, one of the most impressive books on the 15th century, says that Van Eyck was essentially a medieval painter, and that it's wrong to confuse Renaissance with realism. But without going into a lot of argument here, I don't think that's wrong at all. Look at what's usually called medieval and what's usually called Renaissance and see which is more like the work of Van Eyck. His work is much more like what's to come than it is like what's gone before. In the case of this picture, I think one could argue that the symbolic size of the Virgin is at least un-Renaissance, but what really stands out is the overwhelming realism and technique that was certainly beyond the apparent capacity of uh, virtually any panel painter before 1400. This is the Madonna with the Carthusian in the Frick Collection in New York, and like the picture we just saw in most of Van Eyck's work, it is smaller than you would probably guess. It's only about 18 inches high, and the attribution of it to Van Eyck is also sometimes questioned. It was apparently not entirely finished at his death, and may have been completed by studio people or associates of his. Writing in the 16th century, Vasari famously gave Van Eyck credit for inventing oil painting, which is clearly an oversimplification, even if he was one of the first important painters to use oil as his primary medium. Some say that he didn't really fully exploit its potential for rendering color and lighting effects, but I don't really see any reason to complain about the way he painted. St. Barbara appears at the left. She was held captive in a tower and freed by the help of heaven. This has been thought roughly analogous to the way in which the soul is freed from the body of death, and she is often called the patron saint of death. The tower became her attribute. Her presence here may suggest that the Carthusian is painted posthumously, St. Elizabeth of Hungary at the right was one of those who, though she lived before Thomas a Kempis, believed, as Thomas did, that anyone who hopes for eternity in paradise must take the gospel seriously, and even though she was a queen, or at least the wife of the Landgrave of Thuringia, in fact, she lived simply and gave virtually her whole life to helping the poor. With allowances for artistic license, she is also the heroine of Wagner Steinhäuser. The city in the background is painted so realistically that much effort has gone into the attempt to identify it, but no one has yet produced 
a convincing theory. The case is the same with Van Eyck's other paintings of cities we'll see. They look almost like photos of real cities, but seem in fact to have existed only in the painter's imagination. You can see a little man in a red turban in this picture at the lower right, and a man with a red turban appears in so many of Van Eyck's pictures, including the presumed self-portrait we'll see shortly, that some think he's a kind of signature. This is the Madonna with Canon van der Pyla now, one of the most important pictures by Van Eyck, and one of only two still in his hometown, in Bruges, in the Groningen Museum. St. Donatian, the obscure saint who was the patron of the old cathedral in Bruges, is at the left, and St. George, George van der Pyla's patron saint, is at the right. This is one of the most detail-packed pictures Van Eyck ever painted painted in 1436, and it's interesting to compare Van Eyck's technique with what was being done, say, in Italy about that time. You can see a close-up of the saint's robe here, in which the very threads practically are visible. And here now is a close-up of Masaccio's tribute money painted at just about the same time for the Church of Santa Maria della Carmine in Florence. <clears throat> this, of course, is a fresco, which doesn't lend itself to detailed painting in the Flemish style. And it is true that some Italian panel painters uh, of the day did do much more detailed work, but the bottom line is that most of the greatest Italian Renaissance pictures are frescoes, large, broadly conceived works, and none of the greatest pictures of the Northern Renaissance are. Here's the saint's robe again. There are various things that can be cited in the attempt to explain this difference. One is just meteorological. The fresco medium is unsuited to the damp cold of the north. Another is that manuscript illumination was just more of an influence on panel painters, most of whom practiced it themselves, as I've said. It's not a matter of one being greater or better style than the other. Masaccio, I think, is as great a painter as Van Eyck, but, but which tailor would you go to, though? Well, here's the Saint, Saint Donatian up more closely. It's often difficult, of course, to explain in any way that would satisfy a scientist, at least, differences in artistic style and why they develop the way they do. Like a lot of things in history, the fact that Flemish painters preferred small-scale detailed work and Italians preferred larger-scale, less detailed work it's just something that has to be emphasized, whether or not it can be convincingly accounted for. A lot of Italians loved Flemish pictures, as a matter of fact, and it's probably fair to say that in the 15th century, more Flemish pictures were bought by Italians than Italian pictures were bought by Flemings. One fellow who didn't like the Flemish style was Michelangelo, though, who never did anything in the newfangled oil medium. The Flemish style, he said, is said to have remarked, was fit only for women and monks. Here's St. George at the right now. I mentioned earlier that there is often a man with a red turban in work by Van Eyck. And there's one in this picture, although it may take a minute for you to locate him. While you're looking here, I might just tell you you're hearing an instrumental version of Gilles Benchois' song, Je le Amour, or Long Live Love, Let's Praise Love, something like that would be the translation of the title, I suppose. We'll see a presumed portrait of Binchwa by Van Eyck in a minute or two. He was the second most important composer in Flanders at the time, second to Guillaume Dufay, and since Dufay was often out of town, uh, Binchwa was usually the man probably called upon for important music. Well, the fellow with the red turban is at the right where the arrow is now, He's reflected in the armor of St. George. This reflection was not discovered until a graduate student noticed it a few decades ago. I've forgotten the exact circumstances, but that's certainly not something you want one of your graduate, graduate students to discover. And the nature of this reflection, which seems obvious once it's pointed out, is such as to make it look clear that it's a reference to the painter himself, I think, like a kind of cryptic signature. Several portraits are attributed to Jan van Eyck, including this one, the so-called man with the pink in Berlin, 
This is a betrothal picture in all likelihood since the flower he holds usually indicates that in a portrait of a man. I figure he must have been really rich. This is a pencil sketch by Van Eyck and it's one of the earliest surviving such works by an important artist. In the 15th century it was extremely rare for artists to do sketches as independent works of art and sketches done as preliminary studies for paintings are also rare because they were apparently usually just tossed out as objects of no value when the paintings were finished. In this example we can see Van Eyck's own notes at the left about how to color the picture. Eyes brown, complexion ruddy. When we can compare a finished painting with a preliminary sketch like this, it often seems as though the sketch is actually more vital. I'm reminded of Leonardo saying that your first try is always the best, and I'm reminded of his reluctance to, to try to force an artistic effect unless he felt the inspiration of the moment. Compare this sketch with the finished painting now. While we could argue this back and forth, I think there is a case to be made that the sketch has more life in it. The subject is usually identified as, though may not in fact be, the Italian Cardinal Albergati, and this is in the Vienna Art History Museum. Cardinal Albergati came to Flanders in 1431 along with Aeneas Silvius Piccolomini, the future Pope Pius II, about whom we heard last quarter in connection with Sigismundo Malatesta. These fellows came to Flanders to try to negotiate an end to the Hundred Years' War. This was not a success, but Silvius went on to Scotland, you may remember, and reported back that the ordinary citizen in Bruges lived better than the King of Scotland. And he also said that the Scottish women were the loosest in Europe. Before he took holy orders, Aeneas Silvius Piccolomini was quite a fun-loving fellow and an important poet as well. This is a presumed self-portrait of Van Eyck now in the London National Gallery. There's an inscription on the original frame which reads Alsic Khan, Alsic Khan, which puns on Van Eyck's name and means, in effect, this is how I, Van Eyck, can paint. Another inscription on it says, Van Eyck painted me in 1433. It may not be Van Eyck. He would have only been about 43 in 1433 if he were born in 1390. And he looks closer to 60 here, really. Uh, he does look right at the viewer in the manner of self-portraits by artists to come, however. And he does wear a red turban. Of course, it's circular to argue that the other red turban guys, like the one in St. George's armor, are probably Van Eyck because he's wearing one in this self-portrait, and then that this is a self-portrait because the other representations of him wear red turbans. Presumably, also, he was not the only man in Flanders who wore a red turban. And I am inclined, though, as most authorities are, to accept this as a self-portrait. would be one of the very earliest in the history of art, too. Here's Van Eyck's wife, Margaret, and this painting is the only one by him other than the Madonna with Canon van der Pyle we saw a minute ago still in Bruges. And like the latter, it's in the Gruningen Museum. The inscription here reads, My husband Jan Van Eyck painted me in 1439 when I was 33. <clears throat> the fact that she also looks older than her age helps the case for those who want to argue that the picture we just saw is a self-portrait. The fact that she looks an awful lot like the man in the red turban, the presumed Jan van Eyck, has led some to argue that he was perhaps her father. That is, that the fellow in the red turban is not van Eyck, but really the father of Margaret here, Jan van Eyck's father-in-law, or some other relative. But her face doesn't just look like his. They, in fact, have these two portraits of virtually identical faces. In this picture, the two images have been superimposed, and the outlines of the two faces and the shape and positions of the facial features match about as exactly as they could. In fact, it's hard, if not impossible, to imagine even a painter of Van Eyck's genius <clears throat> getting, this, getting them this much alike by just eyeballing them, without tracing one from the other in some way. The outline is the same, the outline of the face. The only obvious difference is in the pupil of the left eye, you see. I have no idea why Van Eyck did this, and I'm not sure we should 
consider it to support or oppose the claim that the man in the red turban is a self-portrait. As I say, I have no idea why he did it, but that he did it, that he made these faces virtually exactly alike for some reason is, is clear. This portrait by Van Eyck, also in the London National Gallery, is clearly of a musician. Timotheos, the name of Alexander the Great's favorite musician, is inscribed in Greek on the stone ledge, along with the words Leal Souvenir, which should be translated something like Good Likeness, and then the date October 10, 1432, and Van Eyck's signature are below that. Erwin Panofsky wrote that he thought the setter to be Gilbin Schwa, the fellow I mentioned earlier, who was about the right age in 1432. He, he would have been 32 that year. Ben Schwa was not as great a composer as Dufay, who was also about 32 in 1432, but while Dufay was in Italy at the time this was painted, Ben Schwa was in Flanders and was, in fact, also Philip the Good's chaplain. So it may well be Ben Schwa. Dozens of sacred pieces and some 56 songs by him survive, and we'll hear another version with lyrics of the another version of the, the instrumental piece we're, we're hearing now. The original version is the, the one with lyrics that we'll hear in just a minute. The most famous portrait by Van Eyck and one of the most often reproduced paintings from the whole Northern Renaissance is this one of Giovanni Arnolfini and his bride, again in the London National Gallery. They were both from Lucca and he was the manager of the Medici Bank branch in Bruges. This picture is always given several Academy Awards, first full-length portrait, first double portrait, first portrait including an action, things like that. Although again it's a relatively small picture just maybe two and a half, three feet high, something like that. These people, while certainly well off, were not members of the aristocracy, however, and no picture yet painted had devoted so much attention to the setting of a middle, or upper middle, class life. Of all Van Eyck's pictures, it's the one which probably most foreshadows the Flemish and Dutch interest in genre subjects, uh, that is, ordinary life. It's generally thought that this is something like a wedding picture, but some think, looking at the bride, that the wedding might be coming a little late here. She could certainly be pregnant, but the pear-shaped figure was popular in the 15th century, and the way she holds her dress also makes her look more, well, more like she's pregnant. The picture is full of apparent symbols. Uh, we'll see some of these a little more closely in a minute. The fruit at the left uh, is supposed to represent the pleasures of life, vague reference there perhaps to the Garden of Eden, something like that. There's a little statuette of St. Margaret on the bedpost, which is significant. Margaret was the patron saint of childbirth, but that shouldn't lead you to think that the bride was already pregnant. St. Margaret was a common figure used to decorate beds where it was expected children would be born. The single candle in the chandelier is thought to represent, as it were, Christ, the unseen witness to the, the wedding. Their shoes are off, indicating again that, that, in effect, what's taking place here is in some sense sacred. It may actually be a, a picture that's meant to represent the taking of their wedding vows. There are symbolic qualities associated with the colors, too, but we won't go into all the the possible interpretations of these things here. At the back of the room, you can see Van Eyck's signature. In Latin, it reads, uh, Johannes de Eyck fuit hic. That is, Jan Van Eyck was here, apparently. Some have tried to argue that the Latin would be consistent with translating this, Jan Van Eyck was this man, but the, the theory that this is, in fact, a picture of Jan van Eyck and his wife is now held by very, very few people. The mirror itself has a reflection in it, you can see. First of the backs of Giovanni Arnolfini and his bride, and then in the distance there, a man in a red turban again, and then a man in blue. It is thought likely that the man in the red turban is Jan van Eyck, and that would explain the sense of the inscription, Jan van Eyck uh, was here. He was a witness to this, 
and, and of course the painter of the picture at the same time. This detail is only about the size of a, a half dollar or something like that in the original picture. Well, we're going to see some more details now and hear the song Jaloux Amour with the lyrics by Gilles Ben Schwagen. This means something like, I'm praising love or let's praise love. The last picture we'll see in this lecture is Van Eyck's portrait of Philip the Good's famous chancellor, Nicolas Rollin, with the Virgin. The picture is now in the Louvre. Rollin was virtually indispensable to Philip as a, a counselor, a diplomat, and is most famous for working out the Treaty of Arras, which brought Philip and Burgundy back onto the French side in the Hundred Years' War in 1435. There may be, in fact, a reference to that treaty in the picture. We'll hear all about Roland, more about the picture then next time.